Anyway, the koan for this morning. <clears throat> and the book of Serenity is case 91. Nanchuan's peony. Officer Lu Gang said to Nanchuan, teaching, teaching master Chow was quite extraordinary. He was able to say, heaven and earth have the same root, myriad things are the one body. Nanchuan pointed to a peony in the garden and said, people today see this flower as in a dream. Nanchuan pointed to a peony in the garden and said, people today see this flower as in a dream. So does this remind anybody of another koan with a flower? A couple of heads not. Yeah, a very important one, right? Shakyamuni Buddha teaching the assembly on Mount Gudrakuta holds up a single flower, twirls it. And only Mahakashyapa smiles. And then Shakyamuni says something to about the effect of I have the great eye treasury of the, of the Dharma, blah, 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 blah. And I give it to Mahakashyapa. So this is, the, that was the first Dharma transmission. It was about a flower. And here's Nantra going to, going to the peony. Now, classes, I have a, I have a kind of remotely thinking about doing a little collection of eco dharma koans, and I would class both those, both this one and that one, in that in, in that in that class of an eco dharma koan. So, before we get to what the koan is about, yeah, you know, what is that? You know, what. What is that? What is an eco dharma koan? What is eco dharma? I, you know, it's one of those terms that I think we use and we don't necessarily um, give a lot of thought or consideration to. And so I, I looked for some definitions, and the the one the person who had the definition that made the most sense, David Lloyd. Do you guys know David Lloyd? Yeah, he's a, de he's a Zen teacher in Colorado, and he actually has, I think his place is called the Eco Dharma Institute or something to that effect. Um, so, so this is a very important aspect to David. He does quite a bit of writing on it and so on. And so he defines Eco Dharma in terms of three things. One, practicing in nature. Two, clarifying the ecological implications of Buddhism. And three, engaging in eco-activism. That's essential, that the, that the survival of our species calls for. Okay, interesting. So that's how he's using the term eco dharma. My friend Aaron Sharf and I, in, in the series of, of podcasts that we're doing that we've, that we've started, we're using the term eco intimacy. And in some ways, eco dharma is a redundant term, right? Because the whole, the entirety of the dharma is about intimacy, intimacy with the world. And that excludes nothing, right? So to say eco-dharma is like, yeah, yeah. I mean, all dharma is eco-dharma. <laughs> all dharma is intimacy with the entire world. Now, interestingly, David talks about engaging in eco-activism that is that the survival of our species calls for. 
And I thought about that. I thought, wow, what an anthropocentric statement from somebody who really <laughs> is very conscious and aware and all those things, right? Because this, this should not be about every species is important, right? Every species matters. And this is not just about the survival of our species. This is about the survival of the least thing in the world. I'm reminded of the koan that we did a few weeks ago where Shakyamuni is walking with Indra, the king of the gods. And he says to Indra, this would be a good place to have a sanctuary. And Indra takes a single blade of grass and says, sticks it in the ground and says, the sanctuary is made, right? Everywhere, it, from a Buddhist perspective, everywhere and everything is sacred. We'd also say everywhere and everything is not sacred, but, but everything is sacred, right? Everything important, everything matters. So why is Nanchuan pointing to this peony and saying people today see this peony as in a dream? He's pointing to the very thing that interferes with our intimacy with the world the dream of all of our cognitive structures, our intellectual frameworks, all of the mental gymnastics that we perform that obscure our relationship to reality, to the world, to the flower. That's the dream and we're all in that dream. Mentioned matrix, <laughs> matrix. We all have the matrix in our head. We're all living in the matrix. <laughs> right? We carry it with us everywhere. And it inhibits us from touching deeply, connecting, experiencing the intimacy of what we know is one body, the whole earth and everything on it, uh, the entire cosmos is one body, not separate things. Separation is an illusion. So when Najwan pointing to this peony, just like when Shakyamuni was pointing to the flower, they're pointing to the essential nature of our reality and the essential obscurification that we do with our minds. This is the central point of Buddhism. It's the central point of Zen. So they then carve out in peace and say, oh, this is eco dharma well. All of Zen is eco dharma and yet, David is <laughs> not being critical. David, I think he's, he's, he's right because it's important in terms of emphasis. Today, this emphasis is so important. The world has changed and is changing. Humanity is moving further and further from having a fundamental relationship with the natural world. And the further that we move in that direction, the less we protect, the less we care for, the less we love, the less we honor. All wildness, all wild beings. So David is making a very essential point. So at this point, I think this would be a good moment to see the video. Now this, this is gonna be, this is like 
a technological this to you know this is my jeff bezos going up in space moment nothing phallic about it but but just technological leap for humankind okay so here we go let me see if i can do this do we need to be single screen not not all the little postage stamps to see this Did I, did you, are you seeing that? Are you seeing my desktop? Oh, no. Okay. I think I left out an essential step. All right, let me try again. My apologies. I practiced this. I thought I could do this easily. Do you see my do you see my desktop now? I don't see you. So I and can somebody say the say it in words? No. We just see you. Could you see my desktop just then? No. no. Yeah, some yes, some no. Some maybe. This should be categorical. You got to get this all right or all wrong. There's no hedging on this. Let me try again. I'll try one more time, and then I won't burden you any further with this. Um, oh, so only one participant can share at a time, so it thinks that I'm sharing. No, you don't want to see it. Okay, forget about it. Maybe it has to do with that other video that you're already recording. I'll practice more for next week. But you can now hear me again and all that. Yep. My apologies. No worries. So I'll tell you what I was going to show you. And it is a, I was just going to show you the trailer for a video called Amongst the White Clouds. Anybody encountered amongst the white clouds? A couple of people have Robert and Margaret. Great. So the the amongst the white clouds was created by I think the man's name is Berger, um, who traveled to China and went back into the mountains in a remote area of China to record the lives of the Buddhist monks who were living deep in the mountains. And these are some pretty extraordinary human beings. I mean, they're, 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 they are way back in the mountains. They have to walk many hours to get to a, even a little town. And they devote their lives there to their, to their they, are Zen, they are Zen practitioners, and they devote their lives to the practice of Zen back in the mountains. What's interesting about it is several things. One, their lives are extraordinarily simple. They get up, they have a little Buddhist service, they cook some meals, and then they go forth for the day to do whatever it is they're doing, working in the garden or collecting wood for the fire the simple tasks that they need to perform in order to stay alive, they have their meals, they gather in the evening for a service, and they go to bed. And that's their day every single day. Remarkable simplicity. And also a great deal of intimacy with the natural world. They are right there. They are in the heart of the mountains. They are affected by the weather, the light, all, 
all of every bit of what's going on in the wild is, is the structure of their lives. And I find this video very inspirational. Not from the perspective of like going off into the mountains and leaving the world. Those of you that know my sense of the Dharma, I don't think that's the appropriate thing to do. But it is from the perspective of what can that tell us about how we lead our lives. And those elements of simplicity, of living as close to the natural world as we can, and of integrating practice and life. One of the things that they make essentially no distinction between is practice and the rest of their lives. In fact, in the trailer, if I had been able to show it, the, the teacher there is saying, you know, he's just saying, this is all practice. This is all practice. So, so that's, to me, that's part of the spirit of ego dharma, and, and the spirit of our of our of our Zen practice is that we should try to come to the place where it's the distinction between our lives and our practice is as subtle and invisible as possible, where as many aspects of our life as can be practiced and where our lives, we simplify, simplify, simplify. We don't need to go off into the mountains. We are all in the mountains. I think Dogen would tell us if he was here this morning. We are all we are all by the waters, and we can practice in that spirit, that mountain and water spirit that Dogen talks about. Wherever we are, You know, and I think that's what Nanchuan is pointing to. You know, in, in, in the koan, let me dig the koan back out here. You know, the, the monk comes to him, Officer Lugang comes to him with this little saying from teacher Master Shao. He was quite extraordinary. He was able to say, heaven and earth have the same root. Myriad things are the one body. And without rebuking him, Nanchuan is basically saying, shut up and look at the flower. Right? That, that peony is teaching us the Dharma. That peony is the Dharma. That flower, that... Shakyamuni held up is the Dharma. And it, it you know, there's a, who wrote, is it uh, Sung Sanim who wrote the book, The Whole World is a Single Flower? Yeah, the whole world is a single flower. No disconnection between that flower and the world. So back to David Loy's three principles. Practicing in nature. Some, we, we've done that as a Sangha sometimes. Some of you have been able to come this summer. We did a couple of wonderful practices here. I'd like us to do more of that going forward, hopefully. I know, we, you know, the, the limits of geography and everything are, and, and of course, the, the pandemic make it hard. Um, but perhaps by the, the spring or the summer, things will, will have changed enough we can get together again. But that doesn't preclude all of you individually 
bringing your practice into nature. Sitting out in nature, or if you're in Maine, walking in nature. My friend, Rob Foley, um, Susan knows Rob and, and uh, has done some, he's a, um, what do you call it? A forest therapy guide, right? That's what he calls him, what he is. And, and so he just called me yesterday and he, he has two, he has never tried a group in winter before. And he has, he, so he set up two groups and he said, well, he'd take eight people in a group. Um, and he, he filled both groups in 45 minutes. Um, which is pretty fantastic. And, 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 um, but I, you know, so there's, we don't need to be restricted by the seasons. I was thinking, Deborah, did you do, when we went to the yurt on Moosehead Lake, were you there? Yeah, you were there. That was a fantastic, I remember that weekend. Um, um, but right now COVID prohibits, prohibits doing that kind of thing. I wouldn't, suggest we all get together in a yurt but but come spring who knows what the possibilities will be but meanwhile take advantage practice in nature you know the thing that i talk about in my probably never to be completed manuscript <laughs> is four s's right four s's solitude and i always say that's an, a relative term you know deborah you've also been to namakanta yeah that that is like solitude on steroids <laughs> but you don't have to go to namakanta or moosehead lake you can have solitude in a park or in a corner of a backyard it's a relative term. It's about kind of getting as best we can apart from human distractions. Right. And then slowness. If we're walking in a way that is contemplative, that is trying to make connection with natural world, you ca we cannot walk too slow. Those of you who spent time walking slowly, I think if you, you know, we notice so much more. We notice the infinite details in the in the, the natural world that we go blowing by ordinarily, right? Stillness. And I talk about that sort of both mentally and physically. So stilling our mind a little bit, I often recommend people sit, do zazen, do something before going out. And then spend this, you know, really try, try to have, if it's too cold out to sit, then at least stand still for a while. Let that seep into us. Mm. And, and sitting formally sitting out, formally sitting, doing zazen in, in a wild, in a wild environment. Hmm. Those things, so we can do those anywhere, essentially virtually anywhere. You know, back, back in the, uh, in the spring we went, we did this, these things in some parks in New York, right in New York City. So it's possible anywhere. Um, So that's practicing in nature. Clarifying the ecological implications of Buddhism. Well, I think that's, for those of us who are practitioners, that's self-evident. This is one body and everything. One of the other implications of the one body is that everything affects everything else. There is nothing that exists in isolation. And we know that more and more these days. We know that what we do in North America affects Antarctica, affects Australia, and so on and so forth. If we had any illusions that everything wasn't connected, those have been shattered in recent decades. Everything is connected. Our lives are connected and our lives matter. 
which is kind of ties to the third one, engaging in eco-activism. What does that mean? You know, I, people often say when that comes up, well, you know, I don't want to stand on a street corner with, with placards or something. Well, that isn't necessarily what, you, you know, I was just reading this, this amazing thing about this young woman, I read about her before, who spent two years up in a, in a redwood tree to prevent that redwood tree from being cut down. And that's extraordinary. I mean, that's just, you know, but that's, most of us are not going to do that. <laughs> it's safe to say. <laughs> but it does, you know, because our lives matter, because we affect everything, even small changes, even small changes. You know, you know, there are people who disagree with me on this. And they say, well, things like, you know, buying less possessions, recycling more, um, composting, raising our own food, um, you know, supporting organic farmers. All, you know, there's a, well, you know, like the world is burning. How can that help? And I understand that. I understand that sense of despair but I think it's essential that we not fall into despair. All of these actions matter. All of our actions matter. How we live our lives matter. Small changes matter. We don't have to go climb up a redwood tree for two years. But we do need to be consciously aware of how we're living our lives. We need to be consciously aware of taking care of the world. And, and I personally believe that if enough people did that, we would have extraordinary power. We would start to see extraordinary changes. It all begins with the peony. It all begins with really seeing that peony really understanding at a deep level connection of all being. And it follows from living our lives consciously and simply. So I will invite thoughts, comments, questions, whichever. This is Molly. I think um, when, when we're talking about the, the whole nature of the Zen, and I think the action part is the thing that is difficult. Maybe it's a Western concept, but the action I think of, I've been raised to think of, as a doing instead oh, of Molly, a being. we can't hear you. Hang on. I can hear Molly. Maybe I need to speak oh, up a lot. I can hear it. <laughs> I, I could hear Something, her too. I can't hear anybody. Okay. 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 Maybe. Right. I was going to say, maybe I need to. Am I okay, volume Molly? or something? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, the confusion that I find is the image in my head of action as doing, as me in the world doing things like recycling and climbing redwood trees and confusing or, or falling into that sort of despair about just the recycling at home and just wishing every sentient being, you know, the best of all possible worlds. Um, it seems like it's not enough, and yet that's all there is. And I guess that uh, that dichotomy, as it were, 
is it's the 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 part I get stuck on, I guess. I can't respond because my sound was down and I didn't hear the first <laughs> part of, of what you said, Molly. Well, could you, do you mind? It was you... really inspired. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And I... <laughs> um, oh, I was just waxing poetic about the difference between doing and being. And what did you say? I mean, what was the conclusion? Mm, that it's difficult to be between those two that in the Western world, the doing is the way to go. And in the Eastern world, the being is the way to go. And feeling of inadequacy by not doing and just being. Okay, all right. So what we would say from the Zen perspective is that the dichotomy is an illusion. Right. And the, in fact, th that doing and being are not, you know, that though, again, those are constructs with our minds. What we need to do, I think, would be the, the sort of Zen answer is to respond always from the place of compassion. What does compassion need us to do? What, you know. And so, and that compassion arises out of what you're calling being. It arises out of emptiness. It arises out of openness. It arises out of our practice. And then action is the, na of th is the, natural, risk, the natural compassionate response. If we see somebody bleeding, we're going to go over and we're going to do whatever we have to to stop the bleeding. We're going to do whatever we have to to help them. Unhesitatingly. Because we're coming out of the place of our fundamental nature, our openness, our compassionate space, rather than doing, you know, some kind of intellectual analysis. That's where we get bound up, you know? Ah, I don't know, you know, that blood is pretty messy and it might have bloodborne pathogens. And, you know, I'm not formally trained. Could I get sued if I go over and help this person? You know, that's all the crap that we, it may be real, but it's crap. And, and, and you know, but out of compassion, we're gonna just run over and we're gonna tie something on the wound and we're gonna help the person. So I see that parallel with whether we're talking about the planet or any species on the planet, if we're seeing, if we're coming from the space of compassion, we're going to respond. And moreover, coming from that place, we're going to know how we need to respond and when we need to respond. And again, that may be different, probably would be different for each and every one of us. I think, again, where we sometimes get in, in, in trouble is thinking like we've all got to climb a redwood tree and stay there for two years, you know, to help. And, and again, that, that one, that young woman was extraordinary. And she did save that tree, ultimately, you know. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes the tree gets cut down. But that's where, that's where her heart took us and where her compassionate instinct took us. And I think that's what we're sort of all asked to do is follow our heart follow our compassion and instinct. Thank you, oh, that yeah. helped. Oh, good. Yeah. I have a, I have a, I shouldn't, probably shouldn't disclose, but I have a height phobia. I can't save anything that's more than three feet above the ground. Climb a tree, no, no, no. Just a quick personal note, Peter, when you shared your four S's with me a year and a half ago, I added a 
fifth S from my own practice of simplicity. Oh, thank you. Just, just wanted to share that. Yeah, thank you. That's 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 a good one. Yeah, again, I think that's the essential point that the lives of those monks in China is are making, you know, and it's hard. I, you know, I, I, you know, one of the greatest challenges that we have is expressing this Dharma in today's world, right? I mean, this is, you know, Doug's talking about simplicity, which is pretty antithetical to the lives that most of us lead. Especially, you know, people who have families, who have jobs, um, you know, who are, are me members of communities. I mean, there's all of these layers of complexity in our lives. And, and in some ways, you know, I, I once had, this used to sort of be a, a point that I was very interested in and discussed with Margaret, my teacher, when she was still alive, was where the, you know, were these old Buddhas of old going far deeper in their practice than we are today. And it isn't necessarily only Buddhas of old, it's like these monks in China. And I think there's a, a, there's a one sense, the answer is probably yes. Even people who are in, you know, resi residence at monasteries uh, in the world today pro probably have the opportunity to go very deep with their practice. But at the same time, that's not accessible to most of us. That's not an option for most of us. And so I think in some ways we face an even greater challenge of finding integrity in our practice in the midst of absolute insanity that's going on around us and with us. You know, that's the, that's the 21st century Dharma. The 21st century Dharma isn't shutting ourselves off in monasteries, as, as nice as that might be. It's practicing on the subway, you know, <laughs> Ram Das was made the statement many, many, many years ago that if you really could sit, you could sit on the New York subway. Now, while I don't know that I would advise that necessarily, the principle is that's what we all need to learn to do. We need to learn to get bring our practice into the New York subway or whatever that place is in our lives, the places that are chaotic, the places that are frightening right right now fear despair depression are everywhere i i think it's fair to say that almost everybody is struggling with those things at some level in their lives you know as omicron comes marching across the landscape um along with everything else, you know? And so this, this is the challenge. This is the, you know, this is where the Dharma in the 21st century not only needs to learn to, to, to thrive and blossom in all of us, but we need to share it. We have something. We have a medicine for the condition, the current condition of humanity and the world. And so we not only we not so when we're practicing, we're not only practicing for ourselves, we are practicing for the whole world. We are transforming the whole world. So if you don't feel guilty the next time you skip your sitting because you're a little tired. <laughs> The whole world will suffer because of you.
Um, Peter, I'm thinking about uh, simplicity. And uh, at this time of year, when one tends to look forward to the new year as uh, an opportunity to um, tweak one's life and direction or another, uh, I don't think any of us are hoping to complicate. Uh, and it seems like every year I look to, you know, how to simplify, how to simplify. And, um, and I can see that, that part of that is, um, is cutting back on unnecessary uh, actions by clearing out one's space. Uh, and when one does that, then I'm thinking, well, where does it Oh, she simplified right out of existence. She's gone. Be careful when you simplify. <laughs> Well, that's too bad. I wanted to hear what she had to say. Huh. We could all go away now so when she comes back, nobody will be here. That would be She just, I, I, I sent her a quick text in case she wasn't aware, and she just texted me back. She said, just plugged in. So I think, oh, lost battery power, she said. Oh. So perhaps she'll be returning shortly. Okay. Well, anyone else have a thought or a comment in the I'll just make a, a brief comment. You know, uh, the other thing is that we, you know, that these things are not easy. Simplifying sounds easy, not easy. You know, we have in the world today a, a whole discipline of marketing psychology. Oh, here's Susan. I'll finish my thought, which has gotten so sophisticated at creating demand and making us buy things. It's, it's, it's terrifying, it's terrifying. Okay, sorry about there. that. Okay. Uh, I, I unplugged when I disconnected the uh, microphone, sorry. Um, so, all right, I simplify. And, and it seems like at that point, what is needed is and the reason for simplifying is to encourage some level of presence. If I'm simplifying, I'm avoiding distractions. And so uh, we haven't necessarily talked about presence, but I see that as maybe that's the gateway to intimacy. It, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. Um, so the simplification encourages presence, fewer distractions, which encourages intimacy. Absolutely, yes, yes. Um, But in so many ways, you know, there's, there's, the, there's the, the mental clutter in our lives and there's the physical clutter in our lives. There's, you know, the, again, this incessant 
hungry ghost thing that we fall into as a society, you know, that consumerist um, obsession that keeps us buying and buying and buying things that we don't necessarily need or even, even want. It's like, it's insanity, but that's where I was going with this kind of these, these um, marketing psychologists, they, they, their sophistication is unbelievable. And now they've tying it to AI and all of that so that there are, you know, it, it takes a, a conscious intention and a, a regular practice to not get sucked into consuming and consuming and consuming. But even those, you know, those are powerful acts that we can all engage in. 